This is Christopher Cernike, hosting episode 4 of season 3 of the Current Topics in Science podcast. This podcast will address breaking scientific news in light of the origins debate and host interviews with scientists. This podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Today on Current Topics in Science, we have the honor of hosting Dr. Charles Jackson. Dr. Jackson received a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology, a Master of Science Education, and a Master of Environmental Biology from George Mason University. He also has a Doctor of Education degree from the University of Virginia. He's a member of Mensa, the High IQ Society, and he's taught secondary school sciences for over a decade taught college-level biology and chemistry for six years, and taught teacher education classes in four different states. In the year 2003, he founded Points of Origins Ministries, and he has debated evolutionary advocates all across the world, from the United States to Venezuela and Peru. His ministry reaches high schools, college campuses, both Christian and secular, church congregations, youth groups, and evolutionary academics. He's married to his beloved, and he gives God all the glory for the success that he has had both in academia and his scientific career, and of course, in ministry. Now, without further ado, good afternoon, Dr. Jackson. How was your day, and how are you doing? Well, it's been a full teaching day today. Uh, I'm still teaching uh, now on the secondary school level at a small private Christian uh, school in uh, the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here, Dr. Jackson. And since this is Current Topics in Science, we're going to quickly look at this week's current topic. The Foundation for Economic Education, or FEE, has recently put out an article called Why Telling Students to trust the experts is poor advice. The tagline of the article is, intellectuals have an abundance of knowledge and influence, but they too have biases and blind spots. The article states that fake news is an ailment that is threatening the country and that fortunately for this country, there are doctors in the house, namely university professors. Continuing with this analogy, the fee article states, Unfortunately, a number of these experts also spread the disease, like medieval doctors who failed to sanitize their own hands. Dr. Jackson, what do you think of this article? What do you think of the interaction between professor and student should look like? Well, one of the comments you made about uh, uh, professors and their authority and everything it reminds me of a, something that Stephen Jay Gould, famous uh, spokesman for evolution in the 20th century once said, he said that this idea that science is completely objective and all scientists are are objective, so we know that's not true, but we don't really fight it very much because it has served us so well. This, This rumor, this urban myth that we're all perfect. And I really did like Stephen Jay Gould because uh, he would. Uh, he was actually very honest. I mean, he was an adamant anti-creationist, uh, uh, but he was he was certainly honest at grabbing the bull by the horns on issues, and this was one of them that he had he had talked about. He even wrote an article called "Abscheulich," which means atrocious in German, about many of the scientific. Uh, uh, not so proven things that have been persisting in textbooks for many generations. The, the interaction between the, the academic, academician and the students um, on any level, you know, from kindergarten through uh, elementary, secondary school, post-secondary, community colleges, colleges, uh, and uh, in universities, uh, and, and in graduate degree programs, it's, it's got a chemistry to it that, uh, that does kind of insinuate a kind of a trust in the authority of the teacher. 
you know, listen to what your teacher says, the parents will say. One problem that comes in is if you go to a Christian college, a church-related school, and just because your professor's carrying a Bible and may be ordained in that denomination, doesn't necessarily guarantee they're even saved, and it certainly doesn't guarantee uh, that they are teaching uh, the truth scientifically and scripturally and biblical worldview-wise. So this trust issue, uh, we really, the best thing we can do is teach students how to think, what actually Carl Sagan called the baloney detector, <laughs> so that they can tell and discern good and evil uh, by reason of use. I really appreciate that you shared some of that insight. The trust was an interesting comment, I thought. You know, what's interesting is that I think many times in the student's mind, you're kind of going into the class with the assumption, my teacher's not going to lie to me, or my teacher's not going to misinform me, or my, what my teacher's going to teach me is going to be accurate. Well, I just had a student turn in a topic proposal for an oral presentation he's going to do on Heckel's embryos and the, uh, the embryonic recapitulation theory. And he was all about, you know, if, if this is really true, what you said in class, it's, it's horrible that they would deceive kids. But I wrote on his paper, I said, or self-deceived, which may be worse, but at least the person is only lying because they were lied to. Uh, you know, it's really, um, I was uh, speaking at the College of New Jersey, and I was having a very uh, friendly debate with a young man who was the president of, uh, I think it was the Atheist Club there. And uh, um, at the end, uh, we had some comments and things uh, that went on, and he said there were many missing link fossils that solved the whole thing and showed the whole family tree. And I said, well, Michael, could you name one? And uh, he said, oh, the, he just went on and on. The, the, the literature is replete with them. There are so many. I said, that's nice, but I asked you to just, just name one of them for me. And uh, so I did, uh, he did. And then uh, it was very easy to disassemble Australopithecus africanus. And then he backtracked and he said, well, that's just a side branch on the family tree. That's all. That, that's, and I said, oh, good. Well, do you know the name of one that's on the main branch we came from then? It's not a side track, uh, a side branch that, that ended. And he looked at the floor and he thought, and a vein popped out in his neck and he was silent. I counted to 10. And then I figured it would be okay to speak to the audience. I said, now, it's not his fault. He was taught that these things were all real. It's not even his professor's fault. They were taught that too. Maybe we should look into these things more. That's why I'm here. But somebody, way up, you know, back and back, <laughs> somebody knew that the data was flimsy. Somebody knew that the case was not just not watertight, but was uh, uh, sinkable, and that it would actually be very much inflating uh, the body of knowledge associated with this fossil or with this concept or with this theory, very much inflating it to get it to float. And I mean get it to float because on its own, it didn't have scientific merit. It just had some visceral appeal to the secular worldview. But when we really want to believe something is true badly enough, you'd be surprised how scientists, who are people, secular scientists, they would be willing to just let it slide, let it ride, put it all on number 23, you know, uh, because it's working for them. Like Stephen Jay Gould said, we don't fight this aura that we have as scientists as being totally objective and being authorities and superior because frankly it works for us and it's easier if you don't have to you know answer challenges to everything that you say it's easier if everything you say is canonized 
or seen as authoritative enough that no one should challenge you. Uh, but no one in science is really worthy of that kind of distinction. Gould, you know, would seem to be admitting so. And I'll, I, I, like I said, I like him. He's very, he was very honest about things like this. But if you saw the movie God's Not Dead, that kind of personality in the professor um, actually is not uncommon. Now, the grandiose thing of, you know, every week you get to say something and I'm going to destroy you. Uh, it, it's a little more minor than that. But every campus, and I've spoken, to, I've spoken on so many, students will report to me that there is always one professor that's like that. And the movie said, oh, you've got so-and-so for biology. Uh-uh, you're wearing a cross. Maybe you shouldn't sign up for that class. Because there is always one professor who's kind of the leader of the mean-spiritedness that might exist in a science department. Many of the professors don't feel that way, that mean about it, but uh, there's so many stories that students have told me about the first day of class. And this could be a biology class, geology, astronomy, or history, or government, or, or English composition, where the teacher will actually ask for a show of hands. How many of you here believe in God? Or how many of you here don't believe in evolution? And they'll say some comment like, well, by the end of this course, you won't believe in God. And what if a Christian did that? By the end of this class on this state university, you will believe in God. Well, you'd, you'd be fired before the end of that class session. They'd come and get you in the middle of your class. The word would get out. You see, but no secular is allowed to do that. Or by the end of this class, you will believe in evolution. You won't believe in creation. Uh, one teacher even said, if you still believe in, evolu in, in creation by the end of this course, then I haven't done my job. If you still believe in God, I haven't done my job. What does this say to the class? I mean, I've heard students who, who walked out the first day of biology, a 500-person biology class because the professor, all she did during the first day was mock and ridicule and shame Christianity. You know, uh, not Islam, which also believes that, that God created in six days, uh, not, uh, not Judaism, but Christianity. She went after Christianity with a vengeance, and that was most of her lecture the first day. The Christian in a group of 500 just couldn't take it. Just, I'm getting out. Got up and walked out. These are the kinds of stories I hear. And this is a violation of the sacred trust. When I'm teaching a class, whether it's in a public school, a public university or campus, or whether it's in a private Christian school, if I'm about to say something to class, I might say, okay, now this is just what I've heard or what I think or my opinion. And I have to separate that from, okay, this has scientific evidence for it. Let me show you the evidence. This is scientific fact. We're going to do a lab that proves, uh, you know, that the, the force of the weight times the sine of theta, the angle of the incline, is going to be the downhill uh, rolling uh, force that's going to give you your downhill acceleration in F equals MA. I can, if I know it's, if I know it's a fact or believe it's a fact, or it's been proven to me well enough, I'll say, okay. If it's something that's a theory, you know, or if it's something I've heard people say, sometimes students very often will ask me a question that I really don't know the answer to. I'll say, well, here's what some people say about that. Here's what some scientists, some theoreticians, some theologians say about that. Well, what do you believe, Dr. Jackson? Well, you know, I said, well, I think this is probably better, but you know, the Bible doesn't give us the full story on that or there's not enough scientific data to actually say for sure. We can't subject this to the scientific method. It's historical or it's forensic or whatever. But I try to make sure the students know that when I, when I want them to trust me, I want them to have a long history with me where they know I don't put my foot, both feet and plant them solidly on something and say, I really think this is true until they know Dr. Jackson doesn't do that for just anything. And I do believe there is a sacred trust. And, oh, to have taught something wrong. Jesus said it, right? If you, uh, 
cause one of these little ones to stumble. I think that really, really goes for teachers and teaching elders. Paul says they are counted worthy of double honor, but I think also it's double responsibility, double millstone time. If you dare to use your position as a teacher, uh, this is one of the great things that gets me hot under the collar about Bill Nye. Bill Nye is kind of the Mr. Rogers of science to a whole generation of kids. And after his show went into syndicated reruns, about five years later, he decided to wade out into the great evolution versus creation war. And oh, the kinds of things he's done. He's become infamous for it. But he had that bully pulpit by being Bill Nye the science guy. And and little children who now grew up and were university students trusted him. And when he was in that debate with Ken Ham, and he, he admitted that all the species he was counted that would need to fit on the ark, that two million of them were, uh, were bacteria. <laughs> I mean, you could put them on the end of your finger and take them on the ark. He admitted that, but it kind of glossed through. And he has actually said some things that he knows are not true, that I know he knows are not true. But he says them anyway, like in that uh, uh, big think thing that started the controversy that led to the debate. He said, well, it's just so, so uh, fortunate that this is only an American phenomenon. That in, uh, uh, thank goodness it's only Americans where we've got these creationists. No. He knew Ken Ham was from Australia, that that uh, uh, Creation Ministries International had been founded in Brisbane, Australia. He knew they had branch offices in Japan. He knew about Joachim Shevin and uh, uh, other German, oh, uh, Werner Gitt in Germany, in Britain, uh, uh, Paul, I forget, and Emil Silvestru, the, the uh, uh, Romanian world expert on caves. He knew about these things, but he still said that. Bill Nye lied. And I think he's a, he's a very good communicator, a very good teacher, but I think he broke the cardinal sin of, of any teacher is deliberately lying to advance his agenda. I, I'm sorry, but Bill Nye has fallen from teacher grace, whether you believe in God or not, and has violated the teacher trust thing. I'm, I'm very angry with him for that. Not so much for being an evolutionist, an anti-creationist, but for lying. He's Bill Nye the lion guy. I know I could get in trouble for being mean to him, but what he did was, in teacher terms, the, the unpardonable sin, and he continues to do it, merely because he's advancing an agenda. Does the unjustified means I don't think so. And it shouldn't on the creationist side either, folks, or on a religionist side, or a theologian side, or a scientist side, or an atheist side. It just doesn't. We've got to go for what is truth, what is work, work, what has reason to it that you can apply to the situation, not a bunch of politics speak or uh, opinionated speak, which is very, very hard to separate anymore. And people think because someone like Bill Nye or Carl Sagan or Neil deGrasse Tyson um, says it, or Stephen Hawking, that it, it's gotta be true. Well, these people in their own honestness might actually be the first to admit that, well, no, just because I said it doesn't make it true. But people have put that mantle of high priest of truth on anyone who is wearing a lab coat has a doctoral degree, is called doctor this or doctor that, which Bill Nye is not, uh, or is put up as a spokesman of science. Science is just a body of knowledge, and the scientists are supposed to stick to objective truth in the scientific method whenever they can. I don't, I don't know, Chris, there, you got me on a rant. <laughs> no, I really enjoyed everything that you said. It actually it reminded me of a few different experiences that I've had. We're going to get into one of those. You mentioned Neil deGrasse Tyson. We're going to get into that question later on in the interview. You reminded me when you were sharing about the students. I have a friend of mine who also is named Christopher. When he went to his university, there was a teacher. This is a philosophy teacher. Uh, right out of the gate, she was just like, you know, 
she had said a lot of like the usual kind of uh, anti-Christian political things, but then she shifted, like, why did you start a class on philosophy with politics? But then she shifted from politics to, okay, so in this classroom, basically, we'll tolerate everything except Christianity. And so Christianity is enemy number one on the public universities. It's, it's amazing that I think you even said in another one of your lectures that you gave at a church that the devil, he knows what the truth is. And so he doesn't care if he's got you over here, if he's got you over here, if he's got you over here. You just can't have the truth. See, that's why it's like, we'll take anything else. We'll take all the other religions or all the other political views, but Christianity... Now, that was public enemy number one in the university there. Yeah, it does seem, uh, I was speaking at uh, USAO in uh, Oklahoma, and there was some members of the Atheist Club there, and one girl proudly said during question and answer period, well, I'm only intolerant of people who are intolerant. And I said, what? then that means you're intolerant. She goes, no, it doesn't. I said, yes, it does. You're the one that's deciding who's intolerant, and I don't know how you're going to decide it, but you're going to be intolerant of them. She goes, I never said that. And the whole audience said, yes, you did. Yes, you did. Uh, be, but that attitude is seen as completely legit. As, and, and so you decide who's intolerant. And, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the straw man burned in effigy these days that's the representative of intolerance is the Christian. The Christian, for some reason, I don't know, they love Mother Teresa. She's a Christian, but but they hate practicing Christians. And why would the devil make us his choice target if there wasn't some reason to it? And why is it only Christianity that's the religion of hate? You know, we're supposedly the religion of hate. Uh, now, some honest atheists will say that all religious thoughts are uh, counterproductive. They're just bad, bad, bad. But most of them will, even if they'll say that, they'll like bore down with the laser beam on Christianity. Richard Dawkins does that. Uh, although a lot of times he goes, well, I'm an, I don't believe in Thor. I'm, I'm not a Thorist. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in any kind of deity. You know, he'll go on and on about that. But then when he gets, you know, musters up his arguments, he'll go after Christians. He'll, he'll go after uh, creation and um, any mono, the monotheistic, the Judeo-Christian doctrines. Thank you so much for all of the insight that you gave, not just on the teacher-student relationship, but even the way teachers or instructors, not even just within universities, but instructors or authority figures outside, like even you mentioned religious leaders, if they set themselves up as some kind of god or deity, like just because I'm professor of theology so-and-so, that doesn't make them God Almighty. And so there is something that I did want to ask you, though, about that teacher-student connection. You were a teacher. You are a professor. And so I do think to say that this subject is very close to your heart. Now, there was a presentation you gave. It was called, What the Schools Are Teaching. You opened it up by saying, Well, after teaching high school for 11 years and teaching college science for six years and then teaching six years in college, being a science teacher trainer... I'm actually one of the few people who is credentialed to critique and to criticize science textbooks. Dr. Jackson, do you think that more teachers and professors should be critiquing the material they've been given to work with? And how can teachers help implement positive changes? Well, I think that all good teachers uh, like to use a textbook, but good teachers are also critique their textbook using their teacher instincts. Um, I remember I was teaching earth science in Fairfax County public schools, and uh, I had the students turn to page 138. We we're all looking at this. I said, look at this photograph of the earth from space. And they all looked at it. So what's wrong with it? And they looked in and looked at it. And finally, they realized someone had put the negative in there backwards. It was a reverse image of what the continents were backwards from where they should be. And uh, I think any good teacher, you know, doesn't have to be a genius or noticing something funny like that. I mean, there was one science textbook that had uh, a picture of Linda Ronstadt uh, labeled as a quartz crystal. 
But I'm not so much talking about these funny little mistakes as worldview indoctrinations that are in a book. And of course, Christian teachers who have a biblical worldview, perhaps a biblical creationist, a young earth creationist, biblical literalist worldview, have really got to uh, keep their antennas up and continue scanning any textbook they're using, even if it's supposedly made by Christians. Uh, it, it might have some indoctrination stuff in there that you might not want. It might have some over-the-top errors or urban myths that are purported by church folk. Um, that uh, make us all look bad, or it may actually have some evolutionary thinking that has gotten in there. And some of the uh, uh, concession theories or compromise theories in there. Um, as far as me being qualified to critique textbooks, it's because of my doctoral degree in science education that I'm sort of a card carrying textbook evaluator. Uh, that makes me officially credentialed to critique textbooks. But I think any good teacher from preschool all the way through uh, uh, secondary and post-secondary is going to naturally, uh, you know, look, look a little carefully at any book or any resource they're using and actually look for a teachable moment like I did with the picture of the earth to sharpen students' own baloney detectors or their own fine tooth comb it could be a, a, a learning moment, but also to look for, you know, filter out the opinion versus the facts, uh, the theory versus the proven or evidented, evidented uh, scientific principles. Any good teacher is going to evaluate any materials that they use, guest speakers, movies they show, they'll watch the movie first. And they'll make sure and point out certain things to the students, either especially good things or especially provocative things that make them think, or especially iffy, iffy things, you know. Uh, so I think we all do that. If you're a conscionable teacher, yeah, we all have that ability to do it. And I've seen it in people who don't even have degrees, but are looking through materials and they're very shrewd, uh, very perceptive. And uh, you don't, I know legally you need to have a, a teacher license uh, in the state where you're teaching, a certificate and so on. But uh, there are self-taught people that, that I'm very impressed with their body of knowledge and also with their, their powers of discernment and the ability to pass that on to the students. If we can teach how to think instead of what to think, or what your teacher thinks, but how to think. Now, you're really educating and you're really not indoctrinating anymore. You're doing the teacher job. That was a perfect answer, I think. It's pretty incredible that the teacher's job, it's not to basically have your brain downloaded into the mind of the student but it's to help the mind that they have on their own to flourish. And so I like how you encapsulated all of that in the end. Now, students will do that. They're like, no, no, just tell me, you know, what's, what's the <laughs> molecular formula for ammonia? I said, you made a model of it in the lab we did last week. <laughs> do you remember? It was the blue one. And they're going, just tell me. I said, no, 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 you, ha, let's make another one. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm, they know by this time of the school year, that I'm not going to just throw out the little fish. I'm going to teach them how to fish. Well, how did you figure out the other molecule? Dr. Jackson. You know? <laughs> but uh, they know that uh, if I ask them a question in class, uh, they can't just say IDK. You know, I don't know. Or, oh, I don't know. I didn't read it in the book. Well, what do you already know about clouds? What? Well, what color are clouds? Well, they're white. Well, they're not always, but yeah. So what are they made of? You know, I'll try and get until finally I can get cirrus cloud. Okay, it's a cirrus cloud. <laughs> and I really, really delight in showing them that they are smart. Uh, students today um, have almost a cult thing going. And this is for uh, Christian students or secular students or whatever. Of well, you know, I, I'm not that smart. 
you know, so don't push me for an answer or don't make me try to spoon feed it to me in little baby, baby, baby bites, but they don't grow that way. And so discerning teachers, they'll, they'll get as much out of the students as they can. And that's fun. It's almost like a tennis match or something or ping pong match. But, but uh, yeah, um, we to make, to give them the gift of how to think. And I've often told students that, you know, many teachers will teach you what, what they think and good teachers may teach you what to think or what they think, but the great teachers are going to teach you how to think. Then they'll argue with you, but you run the risk of making little Frankensteins that are going to turn on you. But I mean, that's, that, that's a danger that comes with the territory of, of true teaching. Thank you so much for that answer. And it reminds me of your presentation, What the Schools Teach. In that same talk, and you already mentioned this a little bit earlier in the interview, you referred to Haeckel's infamous, fraudulent embryo drawings. And after quoting Stephen Gould lamenting the mindless recycling of these drawings in modern textbooks, you said, How many of you have ever heard of U Cal Berkeley, the University of California, Berkeley, the Berkeley Evolution one-stop website, and I keep checking this, it first appeared in 2002, it's still there, it features a chicken embryo with a human embryo with labeled gill slits. Chickens and humans do not have gill slits. And look, honestly, the embryologists at Berkeley, they know this. They know better. As a scientist, as a teacher, I am appalled. I am professionally mortified by this stuff. These guys know better. Dr. Jackson, I'm wondering, can you tell us what do you have to say to the professors who are knowingly or unknowingly teaching false information to students? Well, like I said, the ones that are unknowingly teaching false information if you go back far enough, somebody taught somebody, taught somebody, taught somebody, and that teacher did know that it was dubious, uh, that it was erroneous, that it was misleading, and they taught it anyway because it did what they wanted to do. Um, I think that teachers ought to listen to especially dissenting students' questions and say, well, you know, Maybe they haven't proven that yet, you know, be able to admit that, but they ought to do some deeper soul searching and mind searching. Do, how do we really know this? How do I know uh, that this is, is the way it is? Uh, there was a professor at uh, Tulane University who did a testimony on James D. Kennedy's TV show where he talked about how a student asked him an honest question and he couldn't answer uh, the student came to, she came to his office and he had a long discussion with her and he realized from her polite probing questions that evolution theory really was a bunch of stories that uh, were well loved, but weren't well proved. And he ended up rejecting evolution and then later was, well, then what's, what is the truth later? Uh, uh, accepted Christ, became a creation scientist, became a creationist first, and then realized, well, who is the creator? And so just soul searching about it. Is what I'm teaching really worth teaching? Is what I'm teaching in a fact mode really deserving a fact mode? Or should I couch it like uh, a textbook I'm teaching out of in chemistry doesn't mention that orbital hybridization theory is known to be wrong, but the only reason we teach it is because we don't have any better ideas. Now, lucky for me, uh, my organic chemistry professor at George Mason told us that orbital hybridization, though it was predicted by computer simulations, we know from other data that it just doesn't happen. It's not true. And he admitted, if you find out what's really happening, with these electrons when they bond with, uh, cause the bonds between atoms, you'll win a Nobel prize because we're going with this pitiful thing we know doesn't really work, but it's like, it's like putting a stop, a stopper in it, sandbags trying to hold back the flood. What we really need is a dike, you know, uh, to hold back the flood. 
and uh, we don't have one. So we're just going with this. I was glad my professor told me that, and I continue to tell students that today about orbital hybridization theory. I think it's kind of fun for them to hear, you know, that scientists have got this, they're using it. It does accurately uh, go along with the behavior of uh, chemicals in the universe and the real world. But we know this isn't the reason they're behaving this way. We're just going with it because we haven't figured out how it really works and we don't have anything better yet. I actually made that the extra credit uh, question on, uh, on my test in this past chemistry chapter and students had some very good answers to why would scientists do this? What's the danger of doing this? And can you give me an example? Uh, surprisingly, not very many of them actually said orbital hybridization. Yeah, I'm at a Christian biblical worldview school. They said stuff like the Big Bang Theory and evolution theory, uh, and, and some of them didn't give an actual example, so they didn't get the full extra credit. But uh, I am teaching them to, uh, to look uh, at these kind of things and not just at uh, critiquing ideas that aren't a biblical worldview, but to critique the biblical worldview too. You know, the Bible, and I always tell students this, is the only book of faith that commands you to question it and to question your faith. Test me, try me, prove me, taste and see if the Lord is not good, then see if I will not bless you a good measure shaken down, pressed together, overflowing more than you could ever ask or imagine. Go ahead, try it. You see, if it's true, it can take that microscope and that spotlight of inspection but this is why evolution theorists get upset at students for asking probing questions, because it can't take the microscope. It can't take the rigor of a, a shakedown by the scientific method. And it, it is a scientific uh, principle. Masquer it's masquerading as a scientific principle. It's really a hypothesis at very best. But it doesn't even qualify as a hypothesis anymore because of all the evidence that goes against it. The null hypothesis is, is really what's, what's uh, been found to be true. Okay, yes. No, that was fantastic. And it, what you said actually reminded me about the teachings, passing on one lie to another, it reminded me of something that Dr. Taz Walker said. He said, textbooks, they're full of mistakes, misinformation, bias, and lies. And in the rest of his article, he said, Treatment of evolution by this text was ill-informed, erroneous, one-sided, bigoted, and doctrinaire. The evolution unit tells the students in plain and simple language that they've evolved from bacteria to humans. It reinforces its message with images that powerfully influence even those kids who don't read. The pictures also bypass the critical faculties of those who do read. So Dr. Walker, he went on to point out 23 major scientific errors in the textbook. So Dr. Jackson, while well, it's normal for textbooks to need updating, so what do you see as errors in the modern science textbooks that at this point are simply inexcusable? You know, uh, the textbook authors are doing the best they can. And with every edition, they make improvements and, you know, errata they, uh, they try to fix any mistakes, um, errors in the answer keys to the chapter questions and so on. The textbook authors are doing their best. But when you get into uh, some um, content that goes in the book that is haunted <laughs> by the backdrop of politics, and worldview clashes, uh, then is when you're getting in trouble. That's when I think it's inexcusable because science is supposed to be objective. Uh, Linus Pauling, two-time Nobel Prize winner said, science is a search for the truth, to understand the world, to understand the universe. And uh, I actually said that during a debate between me and, uh, um, three uh, professors, I think it was at DePaul University in, in Green, uh, Greencastle, uh, Indiana. And I said, now, since science is a search for the truth, 
No, no, no. The guy almost fell out of his seat. He went, lean forward. No, 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 no. No, science is not a search for the truth. And I, I was like, he goes, it's a discussion. Science is a discussion. And I'm like, you know, and, uh, you know, I got into science because I wanted to know what was true. I didn't want a bunch of garbage. I didn't want a bunch of fluff, you know, but since science is a discussion and you define it that way, now any stupid stuff you want to stir into the pot is, is now considered legit. Uh, any ridiculous theories that, you know, that's okay if you're just sitting around with your, your friends, you know, at two in the morning, chuckling about the nature of the universe or string theory or something like that, or, you know, how the proton gates in the, uh, uh, in the Criste and the mitochondria actually make ATP. I mean, if, if you want to do stuff like that, fine, but you can't go putting it in a textbook and now mocking, ridiculing, and condemning anybody who, who challenges it or says it isn't true. Uh, opinion, science opinion has become, the distinction between opinion and fact has become all blurred and the reputation of the scientists, it's almost a popularity contest. Uh, the reputation of the scientists seems to be more important than whether they can prove it or not. It's like, I don't care. You know, so-and-so said it. Uh, now, you know, we do that with Jesus, the red letters. You know, we do that with God. We do that with the Bible, but that's our worldview. But we don't expect people who don't believe the Bible to swallow that. I can't. Uh, I'll tell another story. I was uh, speaking at uh, Purdue University to the Atheist Club. And uh, right after I was done with my presentation, there was one young atheist in the front row, had a Bible open the whole time. And he was just looking more and more fumy and perturbed. And he raised his hand to a question and answer period. And the first person, he said, Dr. Jackson, why didn't you use the Bible in your presentation? And I said, what? So why didn't you use scripture to back up what you were saying? You know, I mean, because he was ready. He had a Bible. He was going to tear it in. And I said, but this is the atheist club. I said, you don't even believe the Bible. Why would I quote the Bible? You don't accept it as an authority. If I was talking to a church, it'd be one thing, but that's ridiculous. His atheist friends got the point and totally cracked up laughing at him. That was a dumb thing to say. I didn't say it was dumb, but you don't quote as authoritative to someone who isn't in that worldview. And yet the seculars will quote what is obviously a worldview. It is not a scientific theory or model. It's not a scientific principle. And they'll quote it, and they'll even refer to it in worldview terms. Uh, you know, like Darwin ended his book, you know, there is grandeur in this view of life. And that sounds like a worship song almost, you know. And uh, ooh, like that song I recently heard on the radio about a hundred million forms evolving. I'm sorry, but that was a non-biblical worldview lyric uh, and had nothing to do with uh, worshiping God. I could get in trouble for saying that, but uh, I'm used to trouble for pointing out baloney where I see it. <laughs> and, and me and Carl Sagan would go together on, yeah, get you out your baloney detector and uh, find the snake and take it out of the garden. And that, that's what you, you need to do in this case. Well, well, I don't know if you were wanting to get electrified stuff like that or not, or whether you like to have a nice calm guest speaker, but <laughs> there you go, Chris, brother. No, this has actually been a lot of fun. And actually speaking of kicking the snake out of the garden, that's a perfect transition into this next question. There was a presentation you gave called Alternative Views of Creation. You're looking at polls done back in the early 2000s on teaching creation revolution in the public school. And you commented saying, most Americans want us to teach both in the schools. And over a third of all parents said, just kick evolution out of the schools. Why don't we do it? So, Dr. Jackson, to my knowledge, an accurate representation of the creation model or even the intelligent design model, 
has yet to be taught in public schools. So, Dr. Jackson, what are your thoughts on the teaching of creation in public schools? Um, I did teach creation science in the public schools for many years. Whenever I taught in earth science about fossils, I taught the creation model and the evolution model. Uh, why not? Some of my students believed in creation and some believed in evolution. I taught in the Washington, D.C. area. Some of my uh, students had parents who worked for the Smithsonian. Some had uh, you know, dad who was a pastor of a local church. And as long as both beliefs are there in the classroom and you teach it in an objective way, uh, then you can do it. Uh, as long as you have um, permission from your superiors to address the topic. Now, no good teacher would actually take sides. If I was a government teacher, I wouldn't tell my class, uh, like that Larry Sabato at University of Virginia, he always used to say, I'm all things to all men. He wouldn't tell the class whether he was a Democrat or Republican or conservative or liberal. He said, let's just talk about government and politics and how they work. Uh, in science class, I would put evolution on the board. And on the other side, I put creation on the board. And I'd say, what have you all heard? You have to believe to believe in evolution. What does evolution say? What do you have to believe to be a card-carrying creationist? And is there any like combo that's done? The students really had heard about stuff like, well, maybe evolution's true, but God used his power to make it happen. And so we talked about theistic evolution and progressive creation, day age stuff. We talked, I said, do you suppose all evolutionists are atheists or do some of them believe in God and go to church? I said, let's get rid of stereotypes, kids. Do you suppose all creationists are uh, you know televangelists or Bible thumping youth pastors or or do you suppose there might be some people who don't even go to church but don't believe in evolution but believe that there's a higher power that made everything and you know I said let's just talk about it now and that got rid of stereotypes and everything and it made the students uh, feel safe to share their opinions about it so I did you had to approach it carefully but it was the most interesting. Uh, class discussions of the whole school year. We had good discussions. I told them the whole uh, uh, theme for this unit is R-A-S-P-E-C-T, respect. We respect everybody's opinions if they choose to share. Or you could say, well, my grandma said this, or my pastor said this, or I've heard this. You don't even have to own it if you don't want to. Well, I've heard that evolutionists say this, I've heard about that theory. And then me as the teacher, I could say some evolutionists believe, you know, that maybe uh, life from other planets brought the, the life here. Some believe that life started here. Some believe there's life all kinds of other places. And so we could talk about it. But you can teach. There, there is no law on the books against teaching creation in the public schools right now. Uh, New Mexico used to have a law, but they took it off the books. Now, there are laws against uh, um, if your superiors say you can't, then you can't. If your superiors forbid you to teach evolution, you can still teach evolution in, uh, in these court cases and the court trials that have gone through. It's very stilted toward the evolution side, which brings up the point, if your theory is so good, why is evolution the only scientific theory that needs laws to protect it from criticism, <laughs> from being questioned? Uh, and so all this politicking and all of this reputations and uh, strong arming that goes on um, in this topic, particularly the evolution versus creation topic, people get so hot under the collar. I mean, if it was, if you were arguing about whether it's night or not, I think it'd be very objective and people wouldn't get so steamed up. But because we blurred the distinctions and made this not a scientific matter, but a political matter, now people uh, can get their, their dander up, they can get angry, their tempers can flare, and then we can start shouting and throwing things at each other. And oh my goodness, it's, uh, it's not science when it's like that. So then basically, I just want to make sure I heard that correctly. So there actually, you can teach creation in the public school just so long as you have, say, permission, like from uh, some kind of like the hierarchy of the school. 
So like if you were a teacher in the school and you wanted to teach creation, this is a this is just an impromptu question, but like say if I was a teacher at a school and I want to teach creation, like how would I get that ball rolling? Well, yeah, at the time where I taught in Fairfax County, um, Project 2061, uh, um, there was all this stuff about critical thinking. I presented it to my superiors as a critical thinking exercise, um, as a uh, um, talking about the scientific method and look at the merits of various scientific positions. And so I, I put it up there as a, a critical thinking skills exercise that I was going to show them both models and talk about what both said. I even had a debate uh, that was in, uh, I think it was Science Digest magazine between uh, uh, creationist Dwayne T. Gish and uh, atheist Isaac Asimov, both very intelligent men. And they had a debate through, uh, through the mail, uh, you know, that was scripted that, you know, they scripted what they were going to say and what answers they were going to make. So there were just, the, they each gave their original arguments. Then they each got rebuttals. Uh, and then they each made closing statements, much like uh, a debate forum would be verbally. And I printed that thing out and gave it to the students. And we read one third of it every night and then talked about it the next day. Who do you think won, you know, the debate last night? And who did you actually agree with? which sometimes they'll say, well, I disagreed with so-and-so, but I think he did win the de debate that night, you know, and, and to have that kind of honesty was really good. So I build it as a critical thinking exercise and uh, they were all for it. You know, um, couching it in um, new age, politically correct, <laughs> modern speak terms can, uh, can bring it to where, you know, you know, you're really being a hypocrite if you don't let me do this in class. And in the Washington, D.C. area, you know, all things considered, they really meant it. Uh, they, they did feel like you should be able to discuss anything you want to within reason and time constraints and the curriculum. Now, some places uh, really don't believe that you should be able to talk about everything you want uh, and the college campuses, the universities, certain professors, of course, it, they all cry censorship, censorship, but they're the censors in this case. Actually, speaking of the university professors, teachers, I would like to share. I need to, I need to mention, if you are going to try to teach creation in the public schools like I did, I think it's worse. It's more difficult now. I think attentions are higher. I think they're on the lookout for it more. You have to be more careful, seek the wisdom of God and how to do it and, and be careful because I don't want to get anybody fired. I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Um, I walked a tightrope the whole time I was, you know, in public uh, community colleges and universities and colleges and, and private schools and public schools. Uh, up to that point, I hadn't taught at a Christian school. But I did get in more trouble teaching at two Christian colleges who were compromising on Genesis and believed in theistic evolution. That was where I was denied tenure. That was where I got into trouble. Uh, give me a good, honest atheist any day over a compromising believer. Jesus had his most troubles with compromise and believers. So anyway, I just want to make sure that I didn't send anybody out into the into the bloody battle thinking that, oh yeah, Dr. Jackson did it. No, I had to be very, very careful, even back in the 80s and the 90s uh, when doing this. And it was impossible to be careful enough with compromising Christians, though, people who claim to be Christian. Okay, I'm sorry, Chris, you go on ahead now with the next thing you needed to do. No, thank you for that very pertinent very important disclaimer. You know, it's important to have, you know, as like kind of like Jesus said, wise as serpent, but harmless as dove, where you have that balance. Speaking of the, the tightrope and your own personal experience, I'd like to share a personal experience of my own. Uh, one of my friends, we were in our freshman year of high school. He was exposed to uh, Mr. Neil deGrasse Tyson's, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson's Cosmos series in our geology class. 
Uh, in this series, there was a particular part where Tyson said something to the effect of, when trying to understand the history of the earth, do not look to the Bible, look to the rocks. And Tyson has also said that enlightened religious people don't use the Bible as a science textbook. And it was statements like these that made my friend, he renounced his faith and he stopped going to church. And this was one of the many things that actually got me involved in the creation movement. So I want to ask this very important question. How can a Christian reach a former Christian student who's rejected Christianity because they've accepted the evolutionary theory? Wow, that is tough. Um, Tyson is a very good speaker, a very good communicator, a skilled teacher. I respect his teaching skills. But those kind of um, veiled, it's like uh, a knife under a handkerchief. I mean, that's a very veiled, uh, thinly veiled, honesty approach, blah, blah, blah. It's really a uh, vicious attack on people he's, that are listening to him. Um, he has very good people skills. He presents very well. But the Cosmos series by Carl Sagan was not like that. Oh, it taught evolution. Sagan himself, um, who wrote the, uh, the first, uh, I think it was the first foreword to uh, uh, A Brief History of Time, by um, um, uh, uh, Stephen Hawking. He said, God is all through this book, mentioned all through the book, as back when Hawking was a little more tolerant of uh, people who believed in God. Uh, and uh, Carl Sagan also said um, in Parade Magazine that he was an atheist, but uh, he understood, he thought it would be very comforting that to believe in a God, he just couldn't do that. I mean, he was very, um, you know, he wasn't hateful just because someone believed me. I said, I wish I could, but I just can't, he said. Um, and he, he blamed it on seeing what he thought were errors in uh, the Bible at the time of his uh, bar mitzvah, uh, looking at errors in Genesis, where he thought there were errors between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 which is another one of these little stories that are told, like the stories that Tyson was telling. But whenever the devil has tied someone's mind in knots, you have to go back and untangle the knots. This is what a psychologist would do if someone has been uh, psychologically and emotionally in an unhealthy way, been um, traumatized and transformed into something they're not, torturously twisted. You have to go back and untwist the twistings. You know, uh, this wasn't like, uh, like what the psychologist did in Goodwill Hunting. It's not your fault. It's not your fault, son. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. You know, untwisting the twistings that were put into someone. Now, the devil is the best twister of all. Um, C.S. Lewis, uh, when he wrote the Space Trilogy, uh, let's see, it was out of the silent planet. There was the planet where no one had ever fallen or sinned yet, and they didn't even have a word in their language for bad. And so they just said that this Weston fellow who was visiting their planet was bent in the head. <laughs> he was evil. Bent. They did know the word for straight and bent. And uh, that was the only closest concept they had for the conception of evil. Uh, but uh, to the pure, all things are pure. And uh, so that's really sweet. But the devil is not pure at all. And he's very good at coming as an angel of light. He plays on people's egos. You know, you have special knowledge. You're above those Bible-believing people. You're smarter you're better looking, you're richer, you're every, you're superior being, you know, you're more fit in survival of the fittest. Uh, you really have to look at individual cases. 
what, wh where is the breach in the wall of their walled city? And how do you go back and show them this was exploded? The wall was there because it was solid, because it was real. And now you've been convinced to lower your defenses. Why? What did this to you? What did a little siren song uh, like in, in, the, in Lewis Carroll, you know, the time has come, the Waller said, to speak of many things. And he seduces the little oysters into coming up on shore with them and opening up their little shells. And now he's got them. He can eat them. And uh, um, this deception is discovered way too late, maybe when you're when you've uh, denied Christ and now you're facing him after your death or way late in it, when now you're, a, you're intellectually staked in this game, in this gamble, and you're embarrassed to back out of it. And uh, so now you're ranting and raving like, like the professor did in God's Not Dead, when really way back, he hates God because he took everything from me. And you'll find uh, some kind of a, a hurt, some kind of a knife in the heart of somebody who's been traumatized, what was it that, that caused them to loosen their grip on their faith and let somebody take that rod of Aaron away from them? Somebody take the sword out of their hand and they're not holding onto the hilt anymore. What did it? Um, I, again, I like in uh, the Space Trilogy by C.S. Lewis how the devil tempted um, the Eve on that planet, and it took weeks and weeks of constant long discussions, not a 20-minute talk. Oh, well, then I'll just eat the forbidden fruit. No, that's probably not how it happened. It's this long seduction, and so it is with any of us that make a big philosophical uh, or eschatological change, a big worldview change in our life. It usually happens slowly, and if it can play on shaming you, guilting you, making you afraid and doubting, you know, singing these little songs, oh God, hath God really said? Sounds like an honest question. Did God say, hath God said? That's, that's really an accusation. It's not an innocent question. Uh, courtroom lawyers do things like that all the time. How is this person persuaded? And more importantly, how were they hurt? How were they hurt? Uh, Jesus seemed to always know what to say to someone who was traumatized. The woman at the well had been traumatized, truly. She was a, a, a woman of ill repute in her town. The other women wouldn't have anything to do with her. You've heard sermons on the circumstances of why she was getting water later in the day when the other women had already come earlier in the day. Why she, a half-breed Jew, a Samaritan, and a woman, and Jesus would dare to talk to her. And then she got uppity with him. Oh, our, our ancestor, you know, dug this well. And Jesus says, yes, I know you're part Jewish. I know you and I are both descended from Abraham. And he went on with it. But what had traumatized her? Maybe it was the generations of hatred of the Jews towards her, a half-breed a Samaritan, a half-Jew, that had her ancestors had mingled with the, with the uncircumcised Philistines, you know, and, uh, uh, that, uh, and that hatred. Maybe she was traumatized by that. Maybe that's what drove her to an a immoral life. Uh, and maybe then that only made it worse that she was now looked down upon even by other Samaritan women. Uh, and uh, what was it? Jesus knew. He went right to it. You know, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for water. You know, and yes, you're you're right, but you can worship God in spirit and truth. You know, Jesus went right for what was wrong with the person. You know, uh, show me a penny. <laughs> yeah, you're right. We should stone her just on one condition. Uh, you know what? Why don't you sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, and then follow me? He went. He knew what was wrong with every person he met. He knew what their pain was, their hurt was. How were they damaged? How were they broken? What did they need? 
He offered them exactly, and come and follow me. Deny yourself and follow me. And some people did out of their own recognition of their poverty. But, uh, and I, I say all that, Chris, to answer this, the only way to minister to someone who has fallen from the faith or still claims to be a Christian, but has fallen from biblical literalism, biblical authority, biblical worldview, and gone to a secular or a, the, a theistic evolution worldview is to do just what Jesus did. Jesus said, I work as my father worked. Jesus, I am uh, certain, did his ministry, nothing on his own initiation. He was showing us how it's done. Uh, the comforter who would teach you all things, guide you into all truth, remind you of the things that I have shown you, would draw all men to me, would convict the world of sin, uh, Jesus said that when you're brought before the, the rulers and uh, the magistrates and the synagogues, think not what you ought to say, but the Holy Ghost will teach you in that hour what you ought to say. Uh, Chris, the only answer to that question is the most terrifying answer of all, which I had to come to as when I should be uh, on attack mode. When should I be in gentle mode? Jesus always knew when to say, you pit of vipers, and when to say, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven, and when to say, go and sin no more, and when to say, are you a teacher of Israel? And no, not these things. He always knew because he listened to the Holy Spirit. When you've prayed with a friend who's maybe uh, lost, had some great loss, if it's a little kid, their hamster died. If it's an older person, their spouse. or uh, 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 their mother died or something, some tragedy, um, or they've just gotten a, a very bad cancer diagnosis and you're their friend. When you're with them, everybody shoots up that little silent prayer. Oh Lord God, what do I say? How do I do this? What do I do to help them? And they're crying on your shoulder. And if you're very honest, when you shoot up that prayer, God will drop down an answer to you. Do this. Speak to their heart in this way. Dive right in. Uh, just let them cry. Just hold them. Just quote this. The Holy Spirit will show you what to do. If you are desperate enough to strip yourself bare of all of your pretenses and just say, whatever you say next, I'll do. God will answer you and show you um, in a in a moment like that. Uh, and the same thing is true when you're debating an evolutionist, when you're having a friendly discussion with a secularist in a coffee shop, or, or whether you are trying to talk to a friend who has denied the faith and completely lost the faith, you will need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, and that's the only wisdom that's going to work, and your love. I mean, um, they'll know we're Christians, by our love one for another. Jesus said, by this all men will know you're my disciples, just the love and the spirit of love. Um, the people who say that Christianity is a religion of hatred really probably hasn't come up close eyeball eyeball to one of the real ones of us, one of the Jesus loving ones of us that is born again. Um, um, I find it interesting that when I was hearing Eugenie Scott speak, at uh, University of Cincinnati, she said uh, in her talk about why the creation thing's still going on, uh, she said, you know, 70% so of, of Americans identify themselves as Christians and we, we can handle them. Uh, they're easy to work with. It's those born again Christians. I was shocked she knew the word. She said, they're the ones that that uh, Jesus Christ lives in them. Uh, she didn't even say they're the ones that think Jesus lives in them. She said, now they're the ones that Jesus Christ lives inside them. They're the ones that are the problem with trying to convince everyone that evolution's true. Uh, and uh, I think it's because if Jesus lives in you and he's speaking through you, yeah, you're pretty difficult to convince if you're in the spirit, 
if you're in the spirit. And the natural man discerns things that are natural. He cannot discern the spiritual things because spiritual things are discerned spiritually. And the mature man of God, a spiritual man, discerns all things, but no one judges him, but he has his senses trained to discern good from evil by reason of use, by practice. So there's a practice thing, uh, a learned intelligence thing where you learn from the experiences God gives you, but there's also that spirit of discernment, the gift of discerning of spirits listed in 1 Corinthians 12, and also uh, this discerning uh, between good and evil. Uh, Solomon had a discerning heart to discern good from evil. You will need the Spirit of God, and that's just the answer to that one, and you will have to learn to hear that inner voice of the Spirit of God speaking to you to say what to say to somebody who needs a word from God. But don't get upset if they still don't respond. Jesus spoke right to the rich young ruler, and he turned away from him and went away from him sad. Jesus didn't bat a thousand either, even though he was the Son of God. He was God incarnate. All you are is the messenger. You just tell them what God told you to say, like Jesus did, and then. You, you've done your job, and you've done the best you can. You know, I think Jesus was sad that the rich young ruler went away. I think, you know, uh, he was sad that the Pharisees, who were the leaders, didn't get it. I think he was happy Nicodemus came and, and asked him more uh, deep questions. But, uh, Chris, it's really up to the spirit of truth, who is um, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is the only way you can minister to somebody like that. So you're going to have to deepen uh, your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and your relationship to the Lord Jesus uh, in order to hear that voice, to know what to say next to someone that you're trying to minister to about having denied their faith. Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for that beautiful and encouraging message about the Holy Spirit. And thank you so much for your time. It was an absolute pleasure and joy. And to our listeners, thank you very much for taking the time to learn with us on current topics in science, where scientific discoveries are examined in light of the origins issue. You can find Dr. Jackson's biographical information, video lectures, and articles in the description. Please share and subscribe to the Current Topics in Science podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves.